Right, who, who's got the first book? Uh, Mark, do you want to go first? <laughs> uh, yeah, okay. So uh, to, to begin, the I, I've read a whole lot of stuff. I've read lots of books on lots of subjects. Um, as much coaching, uh, as much about coaching as um, as I could, and about coaches. So I, I'm particularly partial to uh, uh, coaches' biographies and autobiographies. Um, and I, for some reason, I decided at some point that uh, basketball. Well, volleyball, there's nothing, there's not really much stuff around about volleyball. So um, at some point I decided basketball was probably the closest, at least in terms of team dynamics, group dynamics, that sort of thing. And so uh, I quite like basketball and read and have read a lot of um, studying in, in that field, I guess. Um, and then gone on from there. Um, uh, I've got to the point with reading coaches' books, coaches' coaching biographies, that uh, I find most of them, I want to say, incredibly tedious. Um, but uh, uh, that might be a little bit, a little bit unfair. Uh, I find not much new in the ones that I've read, in the ones that I'm reading now. So I started to go in different directions. So there are books that I've read that I thought were uh, awful or, and n not new in any way, shape or form, but uh, other people have really liked. So obviously those books aren't going to come up on my list. Maybe they're on Lawrence. <laughs> Maybe they're on mine. <laughs> <laughs> which... Uh, which is a is a good discussion point. Yeah. The last introduction point is that uh, one thing that I've worked out over time is that uh, you always have to, and this actually goes with every with everything, that you you have to pay attention to the uh, author and who the author is and. Um, What's their goal in um, in writing the in writing the book? And everybody who writes a story writes from their perspective with their with their goal in mind. So, coaching autobiographies, I, I really like reading coaching autobiographies, and you might even find a couple of them on my list. Um, but they are. The, the autobiographies are uh, how the coach would like to see himself, how, what he dreams about when he's in bed, um, what he sees in the mirror and is only a version of reality. Right. And with that point in, in mind, uh, I've cheated and, uh, on, this, on this task and I actually have a couple of uh, what I call companion books. So where you um, read one topic from uh, from two or more different sources. So is that enough, is that, is that enough background? You guys want to hear the books yet? <laughs> yeah, I like the intro though. Yeah. I, love it. I think it's good. So the, uh, the, first, the first book is, uh, is Sacred Hoops by Phil Jackson and that would be my choice, even if we weren't in the middle of uh, the uh, saturation of the of uh, everything, Jordan, um, with the the last dance that's going on, um, that's being played and talked about and whatever. Uh, Sacred Hoops was the first coaching, the first book by a coach that really jumped, really jumped at me. It was. Uh, uh, a completely different way of, of approaching the problem um, of, uh, in this case, basketball. And a really big part of it is that it's not about uh, just straight uh, 
X's and O's for want of a better description. So it's a, it's about using the team as a starting point and how to, to build a team. Um, of course, his in personal story is a little bit interesting and it's really well written. I really love the first three or four times I read it, I just really loved reading it, just the um, just how it was written. So the, the book 1A is Sacred Hoops and uh, book 1B is The Jordan Rules by Sam Smith. So the Sacred Hoops is Phil Jackson as he looks at himself in the mirror and Jordan Rules is, is the reality is the reality check for want of a better description. And the really specific point is, and this is a general thing I should have had in the intro, is that reading a lot of coaching books um, and even uh, so particularly autobiographies, the, the coaches want them to make themselves, they want their ideas to have worked and they'll show a smooth progression on their path. So, you know, in this case, um, Michael Jordan always lost and then I told him about the triangle and he had to trust his teammates and then he did and we won. It was the miracle. And there are lots of examples of this kind of this kind of books. But the Jordan rules actually shows what a lot more about what really happened, which is that it was a long process that took whatever it was, a year and a half, two years, um, to to get to finally get to that point. And Jordan didn't buy into it in the first minute, but the over time and Jackson never relented and kept going and kept going and kept going until the point when it started to work out. And coaches don't want to write that stuff in their books because if it didn't work perfectly, then it's a... Uh, um, it's a sign of weakness, but I, I've actually found that that approach makes me feel bad about myself because uh, the 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 coach I like to read, I like to to know that that the famous coaches um, are not just human, but actually do stupid things as well, um, which might which might come up a little bit later on in my list and. Um, so my first book is the is a Phil Jackson geology sacred hoops and Jordan rules. Awesome. Did you read the I think Eleven Rings is what it's called. I have read, uh, uh, I have read everything that Phil Jackson's done and um, that Phil Jackson's written. And Eleven Rings is. Um, it's just the, it's the same as all the rest of them. So yeah. if okay. if I if that was the only Phil Jackson book that I read, it would be amazing. But it's not, and so it's the seventh time I've read all that stuff. <laughs> gotcha. I haven't read. <laughs> uh, I didn't. I never read Sacred Hoops, but I read Eleven Rings twice. So I guess it's good to hear that I was probably getting most of the same stuff. So. Uh, yes, yeah, because it's the, the the whole background story, and um, and as he as he went on, the focus was always on those uh, on those first three, the first or the first and set maybe and second title run in Chicago, and I always bought the next book. To want to, to fill out the story with more detail of the, the Lakers period and uh, was always disappointed that there was a lot of stuff that I had already read and not enough uh, Lakers stuff. So, Gotcha. Yeah. <laughs> okay. uh, the thing but, that, I, that I would say, when Mark and I first met and he found out that I hadn't read Sacred Hoops yet, he was, to say the least, extremely disappointed with me at that time. <laughs> uh, I have since read it. Uh, I have not been as much influenced by it as maybe you guys have been, but th I think this brings up an important point that Mark kind of touched on a little bit. Um, where you read a, bo a book in your development process 
has a lot to say about how influential it might be. So if yeah. I had yeah. read Sacred Hoops 15 years ago, it might have had a very different influence on me than reading it when it was four years ago, just because of where I was. You know, I, I you know, a lot of what, what Jackson talks about in Sacred Hoops is the Zen stuff. I already had exposure to the Zen stuff, so that wasn't really anything new to me. Um, so it was just, it was, it's a good book. I definitely recommend it. For me, it wasn't as impactful as, as it was for somebody else who would be in a different phase of their career. Yeah, and I think, like, coming from my background, or at least, you know, my view of basketball and of Phil Jackson, like, you know, I grew up, I was a teenager as Michael, as all this was happening. Um, Michael Jordan was my hero. I did want to be like Mike. I did play basketball with my tongue sticking out to try to emulate him. And so the first, so I, while I didn't read Sager Hoops, when I read 11 Rings, parts that were about the Bulls, there was a lot of emotional connection from me to that. And I know that changed my perspective of it. And then when it switched, you know, then when the story progressed to the Lakers, um, by that time, I had pretty much stopped watching basketball and had definitely stopped playing basketball. So I wasn't even really familiar with that era. And so that part of the book was a lot less interesting to me because I didn't have that emotional connection to it. And I think that goes along with what you're saying, you know, like when do you read it in your developmental, but also just in how it relates to the world we're living in at that time. So, um, all right, well, I'll, I'll take the segue into my first book because there was a little bit of a segue there. Um, none of the books on my list have anything directly to do with sports. <laughs> um, um, I read a ton. I do read books about sports. And I do read a lot of specific things to coaching, but the things I've learned the most from and been most inspired by have been books that tend to be um, I would say that all of these books probably are more geared towards the business community, um, management teams of that kind. Um, but I just found a lot of commonality between what the message those authors were saying and what I was trying to do as a volleyball player, but also just as a human being too. So, um, so yeah, I don't have any like, uh, cool connections between the books other than that, I guess. Um, I literally narrowed my list down to like 25 books and then just randomly picked five of them. So um, I, it was impossible for me to just say these are my best five or my favorite five. But um, So anyway, the first one uh, is a Brené Brown book called Dare to Lead. Um, I'm a big fan of hers. I love her writing. I love the message that she's sharing. I love that it's backed up with a lot of research, and so it's not just someone's opinion. Um, and Dare to Lead was a was a really great book, and this is where the segue was in with what you were saying, Mark, in that the whole point of the major point of her book, Dare to Lead, is that you've got to be vulnerable if you're going to be a leader. Um, you have to be willing to be vulnerable with your the people you're leading. Um, and her, you know, she says quite often that courage and vulnerability always go together for someone to really, truly be courageous. They have to be willing to be vulnerable. And I think while, you know, her intended audience for this is just people in general, but this book specifically was more towards, uh, like management, business management or things like that. I took that to heart when I read it for, uh, as a volleyball coach, like that's, the thing I've struggled with most over my years as a coach was being authentically 100% myself around the people I was coaching. And I know that that created a barrier between them and me because I think people sense authenticity and they sense vulnerability. And I think when they can tell that you are being authentic and vulnerable and courageous all at the same time, they're going to follow you and they're going to listen to you and they're going to respect you more. Um, I know the greatest coaches I've ever had were the coaches who did that. 
but it's something I struggled with or I still struggle with. Um, but I'm certainly getting a lot better with it as I've recognized it and then also seen the results of applying it. Um, other points she made in the book that I really liked are making sure that you define your core values and if you can narrow down those core values to just two, um, that you can navigate even the toughest times if you've got those two simple core values. And I'm sure the number two is dynamic and could be changed, but the point is that if we can really be concise about what's important to us and what we value as coaches, um, then when things start to struggle and our team's doing poorly or we're having conflict or whatever, it's really easy for us then to fall back on those values and let them guide us forward. And I've done that quite a bit within the last month. So, um, And then uh, the last big point, um, well, I, I guess those are the two main points that she had in the book. Um, and really it came down to there is a line in the book that I think is great that she says um, – to summon the strength to do the thing, do, to, to, the whole point of the, all of this stuff that we're doing is to be able to summon the strength to do the right thing, no matter how difficult it might be. Um, and there will be more of, there will be a segue between that and the next book that I talk about. Um, but I think that that is an incredibly important message to coaches. I think a lot of times, I know for me, for sure, coaching was just sharing knowledge and that was it or getting people to do what I wanted them to do. Um, and, uh, you know, people like Brene Brown and others have shown, I think that the best way to get people to do what you want them to do is to make sure that they actually trust you and respect you. And if you can, and there's better ways of doing that than just, trying to be the most knowledgeable volleyball expert in the world. There's other parts of it that need to be there as well. So turns out the knowledge about volleyball is actually one of the least important things. I would, uh, I would a hundred percent agree. The best coaches in my club are the coaches. That, and by best, I mean the ones who get the best rate of change out of the athletes that they work with and the team that they're coaching. Those coaches are the ones who know the least about volleyball, but know the, but are the best human beings. Um, and they're the ones I want to keep around because they can learn the volleyball stuff if they need to. Yep. It's the other side that isn't as easy to learn at all. Very cool. Hey, Mark, do you got a, you got any earphones? Uh, I do somewhere. Why? Because I think we can hear us talking through your your. Oh, really? Uh, yeah. yeah, there is a little echo. Oh, okay. Um, hey, you can give me two minutes to go and chase them down. No, no problem. No problem. Uh, no problem. I'll just go walk the dogs. <laughs> uh, okay. Give me a second to figure out why my camera is so dark. It wasn't earlier. That's better. That's that's better. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, I don't know. Well, I don't know. Weird that's weird. Angle. I don't have anything to cover that up other than my finger. Um, I can build something really quick. <laughs> uh, well, for everybody, while we're while we're getting the technical issues uh, improved, um, for those of you who are. <laughs> who are on Zoom. We're actually also, just as an experiment, running this on on Facebook as well. We've got it going live on Facebook. There's actually quite a few people that are that are watching with us. So hello to everybody oh, on, on Facebook. On Facebook? Nice. Yep. Yep. Very cool. Is that better? Does that less dark on your end? Uh, uh, I think we could probably see you a little bit better. Still not very light. I'm, I'm sure it's... It's because of the light coming in oh, behind me, but I can't, I can't yeah. do anything about that. And I can't move yeah. this. This is a, like the only place in my entire house where I can actually set this down. So, <laughs> yeah, well. no problem. Next time you got to choose a time when it's going to be dark here so I can actually, you can see me. Yeah, I turn the lights on. All right, Mark's back. I would. 
And how do I look? And I don't hear echo. So yeah, no echo. Sideways. Look sideways. <laughs> uh, okay. What about that? It's good. Perfect. Looks okay. better than me, that's for sure. All right. Good backup. Hey. I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> All right. Uh, I suppose I should do my first book then. Uh, the, the one that I uh, chose to lead it off anyway is Kathy DeBoer's book, Gender and Competition. Oh. It's, it's a pretty short book, pretty easy to read. I think it's only like 50 pages altogether. Uh, I read it about four years ago and did a review on the blog, uh, but I'd heard about it for a while. And the, the thing that you hear most that, conceptually that comes out of this book is the idea that men battle to bond and women bond to battle. I don't remember if Kathy actually wrote those words specifically in there, but that, that point definitely comes through. Yeah. So it's it's really interesting uh, view on not just uh, what the different genders are like as, as athletes, but her approach is more of you as a manager of people, athletes and non-athletes, and how it's different women working with women, men working with men, men and women working with each other. And the different expectations that come along with those those gender relationships, and how they can influence how you how you need to act in different capacities. Like for example, when Kathy was an athletic director, um, this was a lot of what a lot of her examples actually do come from that. Uh, she talked about she had an assistant who was a woman, and she knew that she had to had to work with her in a certain way that was less command oriented and more cooperatively oriented than if she was working with a male colleague. And it was, you know, so that's some things that, that are really interesting to think about in terms of how we interact with other people that are around us in our various roles as coaches and administrators and, and all that, uh, you know, teachers and all that sort of thing. Now, obviously you got to be careful, careful about stereotyping everybody, but it can help you maybe understand if you're not perhaps not being as effective as you think you need to be or having the relationships with people that you think are going to produce what you hope to produce from them. Um, so like, like I said, a short book with a lot of punch that I think anybody who's working across genders, which is basically everybody, and actually even within your own gender, uh, can get a lot out of. Mark, thoughts? Um, two books that I don't really have anything to say about. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I only comment. I, 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 haven't, I haven't read it. I haven't read either of them. Uh, and my my experience working with um, with women's teams is effectively zero. So. No. Yeah. Yeah. My, I knew you'd be all over that one. My. Uh, I. I mean, I've heard and said that phrase um, that may or may not have actually been a direct quote of hers. The, you know, men uh, battle to bond and women bond to battle. Um, I don't agree anymore. Um, and I don't agree with the, I don't agree with the sweeping generalities that come from a book like that. Um, that, you know, if you're a woman working with a woman, here's how you do it. If you're a man working with a man, here's how you do it. I think it comes down to the individual. Who are you and who's the person you're talking mm -hmm. to? And that's the most important thing. doesn't matter if they're, you're a man or a woman. doesn't matter if they're a man or a woman. It, what matters is the, well, <laughs> okay, sorry, Mark, but it, what matters is the interactions, right? The, the, the connection between those two people in that moment doesn't matter who they are. And, and so I think when we, when we fall back on gender as a guide, that's all it should be initially, but it should never be a rule um, for working with people. I mean, I work with, well, up until a month ago, I worked with close to 400 teenage girls a week. And I can guarantee that they span every possibility of interaction there is. Um, I'm a man working with girls. There's a lot of specific, 
stuff out there that says this is how you're supposed to relate to them. <laughs> There's like two kids maybe that that would work with. Every single one of them is individual, and you have to learn how to interact and relate to and get across to and inspire and motivate and all all of those things, each individual person. So I'm not a big believer in that idea that we have those sweeping generalities that can be applied across a gender or across a situation. I think we have to get specific. Oh, I totally agree. Any sort of one-on-one -on -one relationship, you, you, you basically have to throw out any sort of uh, overarching preconception for sure. Because as you said, every relationship is an individual relationship. Um, and this, this is something that I always, you know, push back on when people talk about this generation, this or that generation, that blah, 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 you know, which of course happens with every new generation. So part of it is just a joke going back to supposedly Socrates. Um, I, I do think, and, I, and I, like I said, I totally agree. I do think that when working in more of a group environment, there are certain elements where, of course, every group is individual, uh, you know, We've definitely talked about, uh, I don't remember if we talked about one of these conversations, but in another context, about how every team, even if you, even if it's all the same players, is going to be different from year to year. So that's, you know, you're always looking to adapt to the group that you've got in front of you at the time and where they're at. Um, but I do think it's worth understanding that how men and women approach things can be doesn't have doesn't mean all is all the time can be quite different I, yeah and i agree but i also think you can find a group of women who respond to a situation more like what supposedly the men are going to do and you mm -hmm. can find a group of men who respond in a way that you know i've worked with a group of boys in the sport of volleyball who wanted 100% wanted to get to know each other and chat about life before they got on the court and played. Yep. So that goes against the idea that they're going to, that they need to battle the bond, you know? Um, and I've had girls who I just had a zoom call with a group of girls yesterday talking about what they want to do when all of this is done and what, you know, when they're able to play volleyball again as a group, what do they want to be able to do? And every single one of them said, I want to get on the court and beat someone else. Like I want to compete and I want to win. And I Great. was like, you know, cool. Like that's, you know, that's what they miss. When I asked them whether they miss most, they're like the competition. They didn't say, Oh, bonding with my friends before practice. They're like, I, I miss being on the court playing to win. Yeah. And so, you know, but that's, I'm not going to get that same answer from every girl or from every boy. But so I think it, you know, it was just unique that there was four girls who were telling me the same thing. And maybe one said it and the others kind of nodded like, oh, yeah, maybe they didn't agree. Um, <laughs> but, you know, I think, again, I, to me, it just comes down to the individual in front of you. Um, yep. So, yeah. Okay. Mark, Mark what do you got next? You got another book? Or, or an A and a B? Uh, no, not this one. Uh, this one is, um, uh, the second one is the book by Platonov, uh, My Profession, The Game. Um, I was going to choose that, but I knew you were, so I didn't. Uh, <laughs> so, um, would have been better if you had. No, the, 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 reason, the reason being is that it's, uh, it's one of the very few books that I've come across, and I honestly can't think of another one, that is just a flat-out book about coaching. It's, uh, it's nothing really about volleyball. It's nothing really about the uh, philosophy of sport or the philosophy of coaching or the philosophy of education, or it's just about this is how you go about coaching in a bunch of different situations. And, um, and the way I always think about it is that it's, uh, it's, he's describing a trade or a craft, something that you, that you work on and improve. And, um, and that's, that's the, 
the way that, that he apparently went about it. And I really like that approach and the fact that it addresses a whole bunch of um, coaching situations and provides examples and, and solutions to those. So um, it's, a, like I said, I, I can't think of another book like it uh, in any by any coach in any sport. So um, not only because uh, my family published it, um, <laughs> is it on my list? But I have to say that my family published it. Yeah, well. The English version anyway. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, I read the book because you recommended it on your blog. Didn't even know it existed until I saw it on your blog. Um, I enjoyed it a lot. I thought... You know, when we, when we as, I've not had like amazing, well, that's a discredit to some other people, so I'm not going to say it that way, but I've not had like super high level, international level coaches as mentors physically for me, like in a gym with them, where I could go in and coach and watch some world-renowned coach interact and react to the situations at hand. I've not had that. I've had great coaches that I worked with, um, but nobody at that level, I guess you'd say. Um, I have certainly have some of them as mentors through social media or through just friendship, but never able to see them in, in those moments. And so that's what I liked about his book a lot was being able to see how he responded to the situations that come up in a, in a gym and, yeah. and compare that to what I would do and think, why is that like, why is he choosing to do it that way versus me? And I know some of it's cultural, some of it's the level of play, some of it's in a lot of it's the players in front of him. Um, yeah. So yeah, I really enjoyed that book for that reason, mostly just to be able to see, how someone who's, you know, a fairly world-renowned coach in the sport that I coach reacted to the same kind of situations I see and, um, and how that was, how much different it was from what I would choose to do and whether I can learn from it or simply laugh at it or whatever. Yeah, I too read it. After seeing, seeing it on Mark's website, um, and it, I've always been interested in the cultural side of, of this sort of stuff and getting the perspective of people who come from, you know, very different countries or regions or whatever, um, and, and even just levels of play, uh, you know, I mean, even the U.S. You know, the you know, when you're talking about talking about somebody who's been coaching in high school versus college versus national team and things like that. So, from kind of all those perspectives, it was an interesting read. Uh, some of it was uh, predictive in terms of where volleyball was going to go, because obviously he he wrote it before a lot of modern developments. Some of it is stuff you look at. Okay, that's probably a little bit at this point. But a lot of it was, you know, relationships and how you deal with players in, in certain situations. And as you say, Lauren, okay, some of that's going to be contextual um, and might be cultural, but it at least makes you think about so, so scenarios that you might be in that it could potentially influence. Cool. Um, sorry to make reference to cultural influence on the team since I learned from an earlier webinar in this series that it's more about the culture of the team, not the culture of the country. Um, <laughs> I just want to make I, it sure. was, I was actually going to talk about, I was tossing up whether to talk about that when you were talking about men, male and female differences. Yeah, there you go. Same thing, yeah. Um, an aside, um, this one's for John. Uh, I see no hope for the future of our people if they are dependent on frivolous youth of today. For certainly all youth are reckless beyond words. When I was young, we were taught to be discreet and respectful of elders, but the present youth are exceedingly disrespectful and impatient of restraint. Uh, Hesiod, 8th century BC. Um, so that's one I like to pull out when people say the youth of today are impossible to coach. Mm -hmm. Like, they've always been impossible to coach. It's just part of your. It's just 
for I mean, and they're not impossible to coach. It's it's a difficult job, and it's always been. Yeah. Welcome to reality. Yeah. Um, I mean, the teenage brain is hardwired to not do what adults tell it to do. I mean, that's that's it's in the biology of our brain, and as soon as you realize that, you can stop battling against it and actually start working with it. So, um, at least in my that's my re- interaction with teenagers. Um, on to my book, my next book, I guess. Um, this one does have sporting context. Um, there's definitely a lot of sports referenced in it. Um, and that's uh, Range by David Epstein. Um, he's also the author of The Sports Gene, um, which I found also to be a pretty f- fantastic book just because of how much it made me think. Um, I didn't necessarily fully agree with everything in it, but I think that's the sign of a great book is when you don't. Um, same with Range. Don't fully agree with everything in it, but it sure made me think a lot and just had some really great points. And if you're not familiar, the the main point of the book was um, it shows that having a broad spectrum of skills and interests um, and taking your time to figure them out is better than just specializing in one area. And he applied this to sports and business and pretty much every aspect of life to show that while we get enamored with the specialists like your Tiger Woods, um, we the people like your Roger Federer's tend to be the ones who end up more successful in the long run, um, by and large. Um, there's always the outliers, the people who do great, amazing things by specializing early and only and only being good at one thing. But on the whole, there's more people who are successful at whatever they've chosen in life when they have a greater range of experiences outside of the area in which they are choosing as their path. Um, You know, and his three points were, three big points were uh, to become excellent, don't specialize early in life, experiment with many different paths. Um, You will be better at innovating and more successful if you have a breadth of experience And the more famous you become for being an expert in one area, the more likely it is that you will be terrible at making accurate predictions about your field. Um, I thought that was a really interesting point because we get so, we put our blinders on and we only know one thing and we're not, we don't have a breadth of knowledge to really truly look at it. And I see that in the coaching world a lot. I felt this book, obviously it was intended partially for sports. There's a lot of sports references in it. His main reference point through the whole book is the Tiger versus Roger better comparison. Um, and he uses that analogy through the whole book. Um, but I think it, for me as a developmental coach, it was extremely uh, helpful to help us formulate or round out, <laughs> add more range to our Uh, to our concept of how we work in our gym and recognizing that um, forcing kids to specialize at an early age um, adds to a a host of issues later, Um, even though it can result in immediate gains. Those gains might be offset by the the negatives that come from that early specialization. and, um, the, you know, just being able to apply that idea of how we can create a greater range of experience for the kids in our gym, um, but also for me as a coach, how can I, you know, that, that's always just been how I've done things, but having something like this was a lot, having someone who spent a lot of time researching this to back that idea up that maybe reading all these business books and reading books on anatomy and astronomy and doing all this other stuff and, you know, being a, I don't know, just all the other various things that I do in my life. I've always felt they helped me be a better coach um, and that I wouldn't be as where I'm at now if I hadn't done those things um, that had nothing to do with volleyball. Um, And I, I think that that's, uh, you know, again, coming back to that first book, um, you got to be authentic and courageous and vulnerable to be a good leader. I think you do that by becoming a great human being. And I think we become great human beings by having a vast amount of experiences 
in which to formulate who we are off of rather than just having a small set of circumstances to determine who we become as a human being. So um, I really loved this book. Um, I read it and then listened to it and then read it again. It's um, had a really a lot of great stories in it. Um, I think that's another awesome thing about books like this and authors like this, the people who can interlace their facts with stories so that you start to understand the facts better um, or believe the facts more in some cases. Um, you know, John Kessel's uh, told me many, many times he has a saying that's, and I know it's not his saying, but he's the one I heard it from, uh, what's truer than true? Um, and the answer to that is the story. Um, people are going to believe a story more than they're going to believe facts. Um, and I think when an author can interlace fact-based stories into a, a book full of a lot of science and a lot of facts, it makes it a way more enjoyable read, but it also helps you remember it and apply it more to your own life. So, mm -hmm. so that was my take on range. Which, by the way, was by the way, it was a pretty much written to be a 100% counter to Erickson's 10,000 hour idea and his idea of deliberate practice and spe early specialization. So, uh, so was um, what's the first one? So was the sports gene. Yes, yeah, sports gene was definitely more sports gene. Yeah, was more like. Very, very science, <laughs> and and uh, I don't, I don't, I don't remember it as being particularly science. Well, I mean, if you look in the end notes and look all the references, it's a pretty uh, okay. heavily, heavily uh, footnoted book as far as the references yeah. to research papers and the science done and all that stuff. Um, Range is as well, but not as much. It's meant to be a much more, much more um, digested by yeah. the norm. You know, like the average reader. I think so. I read uh, I read Sports Gene. I really enjoyed that as the uh, counterpoint to. Well, it's not a counterpoint. It's more of a reality check to the. Uh, talent is overrated and whatever the other talent is overrated is, is one that I read. Um, and I think there's another, there's another one of those 10,000 hour yeah. um, kind of treatises. Um, and uh, this one is, what's uh, I forget the name of it already, but uh, it's actually on my list of, of uh, books to read this one. And um um, I'm suddenly remembering all the Michael Lewis books that I could have included in my list, but the <laughs> Michael Michael Lewis's oh, latest. Oh, uh, latest. Oh. Not the uh, one on Kahneman and Tversky. No, no. No, no. That's, uh, I, I read that one. The one that came after that. Michael Lewis writes more books than <laughs> uh, he'll write more books than I read. So. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, Epstein, I, I really... I really enjoyed his uh, the first one, and I'd, I'd like to read Range soonish. Uh, I was trying to find the book that you're referring to by Michael Lewis. Um, I don't know. I don't know which one. You're right. He's got a lot of books. I'll, yeah, <laughs> I'll, look, I'll look. I'll look it up. Put it in the. Um, there are so many. Um, Moneyball, Moneyball actually could be on my list. I agree. That was a very good book. Are you talking about his new one, The Fifth Risk? Um, it must be. Of, that's a very politically oriented no, one. No, it's not that one. The Undoing Project? Uh, I've read that one. That's the one that well, we'll, John was just talking about. I really liked that book a lot. Yeah, I, I've read uh, half of Kahneman's book. So the Lewis's be. book, Lewis's book on Kahneman and Tversky or Kahneman's book or both. Uh, I've read, um, I have read the undoing project and I have read Kahneman's okay. book. 
or at least half of it until I thinking uh, fast, thinking, thinking, fast thinking fast and slow. Thinking fast and slow. Yeah. Another good I need one. to get to that one. I'm not just... No, well, you right. don't like. I can say that your life is better if you don't read that book. <laughs> <laughs> Shoot, I gotta switch up my. I gotta switch up my books real fast. Hold on. <laughs> you, you, uh, um, you understand more about life, but it doesn't make you feel it doesn't, better. Doesn't about. make life better, <laughs> right? Right. <laughs> yeah. No, that's one hundred percent my take that's on true. it. That's true. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And I got no, to. I, I got to two thirds of the way through, and I just said, "I this, I can't, I, I can't keep going with this. I'm not going to be able to get out of bed in the morning." It is an amazing, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's an amazing book. There's yeah. no question about that. I love yeah. it. But that stuff is all tied up in my, in the research I did for my PhD, so I'm already pretty well aware of of all that stuff. But it, uh, it could be an interesting read anyway, just professionally speaking, maybe not personally speaking. Okay. <laughs> John, we're on you. Yep. My next book is The Brain Always Wins by John mm -hmm. Sullivan and Chris Parker. This one, I actually, um, I came to thanks to Mark's brother, Alexis, who had posted something that he had seen in an academic type conference where I think it was Sullivan uh, was speaking. And it, it was kind of tied in with, with mental toughness that I was, kind of in a phase of of exploring a bit and so you know I, I you know followed on from there and found this book which really isn't about mental toughness there's there's little bits you know on that topic in there but broadly speaking it's just about how little we actually pay attention to what's going on with our brains and how it influences everything yeah. uh so it's it's broken up into basically six primary uh chapters uh, physical activity, rest and recovery, optimal nutrition, cognitive function, emotional, emotional management, and socialization and communication. And each of those chapters has kind of like a half explanation of, of how this plays out in our lives. You know, and this is obviously beyond sport, but for those of us, you know, coaching, it, it's heavily influential. Um, and then the second part of it is kind of is, is like activities, things you can do to improve these elements uh, of, of your brain function and how they, they apply to your work. So uh, some of the, the kind of the related topics that I came in, there was one of the things they mentioned was the link between mental toughness and, and fitness and fatigue, which is, as soon as you read it, you're like, yeah, that makes total sense. Yeah. Um, yeah, if you think it's them, you should probably think some more because it's probably not them. Uh, more is not better. Better is better. Um, and the coaching environment that you create matters a lot. Um, this is, that's not strictly from the book, but it's also from that presentation that I talked about. Um, for me, a lot of it ties in with the, this idea that we're not just trainers of physical skills. Yeah. Uh, yes, obviously we're teaching people how to, how to perform physical skills in a physical context, but, Underlying all that is the brain is driving everything that you do, you know, from the motor perspective, from the emotional perspective, from the influence of fatigue and recovery, all that stuff, and the role that that all plays in how we perform, how we learn, how we as coaches interact or fail to interact with our teams. So there's a lot of this is a, this is a think book. This is a, a lot of idea triggering sort of content. I have not read that, but I just put it on my list to get because that sounds like my kind of book. Yeah, I definitely it like. Sounds the, a lot like the brain rules, which is another one on the very similar topics, I guess. Um, okay. I read that one and enjoyed it a lot, so that one sounds like a good one. Okay, I'll make a note of that. Good. Sounds uh, great. You, can't you mentioned. Uh, can't believe Alexis hasn't given it to me for my for my Christmas or something for Christmas. <laughs> I, well, maybe he hasn't read it. I don't know. I mean, like I said, he had gone to a conference and he kind of picked that bit up. Um, but I don't know if he's pursued it any further. I'm going right. to be on a thing with him tonight, so maybe I'll yeah. remember. Find out. <laughs> okay. All right. You're up, Mark. Um, I'm up. So the um, the next one is uh, another. 
uh, double. Uh, so it's a, the, this one is Bill Walsh, the football coach. Um, so the the key book in here is the uh, is the biography, uh, which is called The Genius, um, and his his version of that is uh, Winning Takes Care of Himself, and um, so Bill Walsh is is famous for being for uh, I guess having an overarching vision of a whole organisation from top to bottom. Um, and how he does that and goes about that is the um, secret to his success, such that it is, uh, to the extent that he was called, uh, he was nicknamed within his field as uh, the genius. Um, uh, one, cor- and- one quick correction, Mark. Uh, the title of the second book is The Score Takes Care of Itself, for those who might be trying to look it up. Ah, okay. Carry on. Sorry. I did look at it on my own shelf. So the score takes care of itself. <laughs> um, and he obviously, uh, if you know even a little bit about sport, he revolutionised the way that people played and approached um, playing American football. The key takeaway for me is, so the, the, his book is about the vision and control and organisation and and all of the details. Um but the the genius is is uh, for want of a better description humanizes the process and humanizes him and and as I talked about a little bit earlier, um, it's easy as a coach to read things and and imagine that the best coaches are the best coaches because things work for them and they never make mistakes and uh, once they start. Once they come up with their great idea, everything is smooth sailing from there. And, um, and the genius really sort of goes through season by season and how, for how much of the time through the period where he was the genius, he was actually really close to the edge of um, physically burning out, but of losing the games, of not making playoffs, of um, you know, how many times that, it was uh, it was actually all in the balance, and um, the the idea again that that the the great coaches with the great ideas that we that we follow, the ideas are just pretty good ideas that uh, and they um, and they they have luck, they have stumbles, uh, and for me that's a that's a really important. It's a really important takeaway, and probably in I could pick seven or eight books with, with that kind of takeaway that, that for me is really important. And it's something that I didn't learn for myself until three or four years ago, even. Interesting. I'll have to check that out. I've never been much into American football. Um, I'm not at all. And it's, I did read one, I don't even remember who it was about. Uh, he was a Texas, a coach in the college in Texas, I think. Um, and it was similar in the regards of what you're talking about. Um, he was He's a extremely famous coach. If I remember his name, I'm sure people would know who he was. But um, he revealed a lot of the same kind of things where the, a lot of the story was about the times that he failed and the stumbles and the wanting to quit and the choices that led to really bad outcomes. And that, you know, when you, I do think it's very cool when a, when someone is writing a story about themselves and they're willing to put that out in front as what got them to where they are, it does make it, it makes you, it makes me the reader feel like they can connect and maybe I could actually have some semblance of similar success because it's realistic rather than yeah. this golden path. To, yeah. Yeah. So I, I agree. I, I like those kind. I'll have to check that out. Yeah. A, a book that I haven't read, but comes from the football world that I don't know, might be the one you're talking about or, or maybe not. 
um, is Junction Boys. It's it's Bear Bryant. Okay, this was a, a film a few years ago, I believe adapted from a book. But it's it's Bear Bryant when he was working at I believe uh, UTEP, University of Texas El Paso. So before he moved on to Alabama, where he got famous, and it's just an example of of brutal coaching back in the I don't know sixties, I guess maybe something, maybe the fifties. Uh, you know, taking guys out in the in the scrub in West Texas and just not letting them drink and just the, the hard hard discipline of that time and the impression that you get from the from the film is that he had a lot of regrets later in life and he couldn't believe it that some of those players still had any respect for him decades later when he looked back on just how miserable a bastard he was in those early years anyway Uh, the book the book i was talking about is called swing your sword and it's uh, Mike Leach. Oh, Mike Leach. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Mike Leach. This I really like that book because uh, he he talked about perspective and um, the the American football way of approaching the the balance between running and throwing is that mm. is the traditional way is that you run first and then. Once people are ready for the run, then you can start to throw. And his he was famous for throwing all the time. Right. But he he reframed the question and he said, actually, what you have to do, what you have to have is that people are equally afraid of the run and the throw. So you don't have to do. Sorry. I just said that creates more confusion. So well. The, the point is not that you have to do one before the other. The point right. is just that the, um, and that was a, like a really key point to me. I, I remember reading that and there's a, there's a whole lot of technical things in volleyball that are the same idea. So there's a, the one that come, I think of is in setting that you have to be facing a certain, or you have to take the ball in a certain position. So the middle blocker, uh, doesn't move first and you don't have to take the ball in an a position you have to take the ball in what you have to do is make sure the middle blocker isn't ready for what you do right so it does that doesn't mean you have to have the ball here you can have right. the ball here or every time you can have the ball here every time or you can have the ball in a different place every time because that works too yeah but yeah the the that uh, michael leach thing is a uh, I, that was a really enjoyable book. Yeah, I mean, that was the f- only book in my entire life I've ever read that had anything to do with American football. <laughs> and it was recommended to me by a friend, and I I bought it and didn't start it for probably a year Yeah. because I just was like, I don't have, you know, a lot of interest in that sport. I didn't even really know who he was. And then when I started reading it, I was hooked. I think I read it in 24 hours. Um, it yeah, was. Yeah. It was a fantastic book, and I wrote back, and I've read it at least twice more, so three times total. Just so many really cool ideas. And the other part of it that I really enjoyed was uh, the moral, um, like the moral argument that goes on in it because of him being released from his coaching job. And, you know, like everything that happens, because when he got released, it was kind of scandalous, and there was this huge media frenzy about why he was being released. and. Yeah. Uh, and that part of the book I thought was, you know, that's a part of coaching. Not a lot of people get to see the inside story on. And Mm -hmm. I thought it was, uh, really awesome to see how he handled that part of his life. Cause that was, he had this amazing illustrious career and then, you know, had this really tumultuous being released and, uh, how he, as a human being, addressed that I thought was just really cool. So anyway, that wasn't one of my books on my list. I don't, but it was good that we brought it up. Um, you we wouldn't need five, John. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> um, I guess I'll move on to my next one. Um, uh, this one is a book called um, Radical candor 
Um, and I forgot to write down her name. Kim, uh, what is her name? I'll look it up. Be a kick-ass leader and empower your... Kim Scott. Yeah, Kim Scott. Okay, yeah. So I just thought the reason why I really... And we've actually... We use this as an extremely simple... Um, simplified version to put in front of our coaches before every season to talk about what their role as a leader is in the gym. Um, and her term radical candor comes from this four quadrant thing. You know, she basically says there's two, there's two things that you, that are to, to be a good leader, you have to care personally. And at the same time, you have to challenge directly. Um, and if you can do those two things well, you're going to be a good leader. And um, so she creates this four quadrant thing. And I'm not going to try to draw it. The last time I tried to draw something on this webinar, it was a mistake. So I'm not doing that again. Uh, <laughs> but it's just a four quadrant. And, you know, the top is caring personally and the going this way is challenging directly. So your goal is to get to radical candor where you are both caring personally and challenging directly. Um, but when you have someone who cares personally, but is not, but is afraid to challenge directly, you get what she calls ruinous empathy. And that I think is where the vast majority of coaches I know, including myself have lived most of our coaching lives is in this space, especially with juniors um, who are, especially with juniors club where people are paying and all this stuff. And we're, there's yeah. just this fear of truly challenging the kids. Like, and we care about them, or we probably wouldn't be coaching because it's you don't get much else out of it. Um, but there's not this challenge. So you get this thing she calls ruinous empathy, where and I just love that term, ruinous empathy, because that's kind of what you're doing. You're ruining their possibility of being a better volleyball player by being so empathetic, but without giving them any information to help them get better. Um, and then on that even worse side, you get the people who um, challenge directly, but don't care personally. And she calls that obnoxious aggression. And this is another thing I see about a, a lot of coaches in the juniors world, coaches who, um, and I see it at every level, but my experience is mostly with the junior level you get these coaches who um, their concern is either more about their own success or about their job or they just, you know, whatever. They're not really too, they don't really care deeply about the individual kid in front of them. And so they, they're challenging them directly, but there's not been that connection of care and empathy created. And so then that just becomes obnoxious aggression. Um, and the kid ends up, usually eventually tuning that out either through just not listening anymore or through quitting. Um, and then on the other, and then the other fourth one is when we um, don't do either. We're not caring personally or challenging directly. And she refers to that as man manipulative insincerity. Um, we're trying to get kids to do, or we're trying to get our players to do what we want them to do but we're not giving them any information to help them do it. And we don't care if the, we don't care about them as, enough to actually like help them become better. We're just telling them you got to pass better. That to me is manipulative insincerity. You know, and I've heard so many coaches, we get tons of kids in our program who tell us like these, this is the kind of feedback they get from their, from their coaches elsewhere or in the past. Like uh, I was pulled from a game. Well, what'd the coach tell you? you know, I had to pass better. Okay that to me is like manipulative insincerity. Like there's no information there and there's no, there's not enough personal care there to actually help that kid get better. It's just a demand. Um, so we, we focus on trying to help our coaches understand based on this book and based on her ideas from her website um, of radical candor. How can we display care and challenge directly? Um, and I, I thought this book, her Ted talk is amazing. The book itself was great. Um, I think you could 
in all honesty, I think you could get away with buying like the $2 summary on Amazon and not read the whole book and you'd get like 95% of the information that you needed or just watch the Ted talk on YouTube. It's more about the information than it is about the book itself in this one. Um, some of the others, I felt like the, the format of the book, the context of the book actually made it a better message. But this one, I don't feel that way. I feel the information is the important thing. And if you can consolidate that information through another source, I think it's a better use of your time. Um, she does talk about some other things like, um, you know, rethinking ambition, uh, how to make sure you're getting stuff done with your team, how to stay centered, um, uh, you know, things like that. But um, my favorite part of the whole book was those four things, you know, obnoxious aggression, ruinous empathy, manipulative insincerity, and radical candor. And I just challenge my coaches every day, like, which one of those are you representing today? Um, you know, and we want to be as often as possible in radical candor. And I know for me personally and a lot of the coaches in my gym, it's, been, it's very difficult to – it's easy to – it's been very easy for our coaching staff to care about the kids. It's very difficult to challenge them directly and teaching and learning. Cause for me, it's been learning and then teaching that to our other coaches, how to do that in a way that still maintains the dignity of the person in front of you has been an awesome, awesome opportunity for us. And it started for me with this book. So it's a big one for me. The, uh, I have, I haven't read that one. Um, but listening to listening to your proceed of it, the the ruinously empathetic one, the one the bit that jumps out at me at the part about that that jumps out at me is the uh, connection to parenthood. So that's a, I have a suspicion that's a particularly dangerous area to go into if you're a parent, and probably what a lot of people are. Uh, talking about the young people of today, it's their parents' fault, is exactly yeah. that. Yep. Yeah, and she actually makes a huge reference to that, I think in the TED Talk more so than in the book, about yeah. how these that is a pretty common place to find parents, is in yeah. that ruinous, ruinous empathy area where they care very deeply, but they don't want to, they don't want to create boundaries and they don't want to create rules. They're trying to be let empathy be the only driving factor. And yeah. it just becomes, you know, then you get the entitled kid who has never been challenged and held yeah. accountable. And is that the kid's fault? No. <laughs> uh, you know, my dad, would say it's San yeah, my dad would say it's San Andreas' fault, but I think that's not true either. <laughs> the, uh, I only bring that up because it still feels like an earthquake in here. <laughs> Uh, the one about the kids, the kids don't know anything. There's a, there's a, a meme from a famous, from a well-known college coach. I forget which sport, which is, uh, uh, it says, is it the, is it the kid's fault? He said, no, of course not. Kids don't know shit. <laughs> it's, the, it's the parents' fault because yeah. they, you know, anyway. They, they learn what they're taught and we exactly. teach through our interaction with them. And if, yeah, I, I think this is a great, like it's anytime you get a four quadrant diagram to explain life, it certainly <laughs> way oversimplifies everything. But I think it's a really great uh, framework to start from and to question yourself and to make changes from. And then once you've got there, leave the four quadrants behind and move forward, you know, so... Um, Move on to the list of seven points. That's right. You got to get the seven. Yeah. Well, seven positive and seven negative. You got to have the columns oh. after that. Yeah. It's oh. important. <laughs> My, I should have, maybe I shouldn't say this at all, or I should have led with this, but one of the, I, I wish I remembered where it came from, but that um, the observation that one of the seven habits of highly effective people is not reading self-help books. <laughs> yep. yep. So, and, and to the point about the the quadrant, I mean, there's a saying. I think it's maybe more from economics than other places. But 
so all models are bad, but some models are useful? Yeah, yeah. I, I, Speaking of models that are bad, there was one, there's one author who I've, I don't remember any of these people, so, but he said that it, the, the selling point was the 28 things that you have to put, you, you, you have to do something like that. And I've actually written straight back to him on Twitter saying, mate, 28 is far too many. Nobody's going to do 28 things. And, and he's actually, he's actually written back and said, oh no, you know, you have to, if you don't read it, you, you'll never know. And I just said, mate. Yeah. <laughs> no. Yeah. Those, yeah, the the big lists like that, I'm all like, whew, yeah. now we're, yeah, the, it's boil it down to like three things for me yeah. at most. <laughs> if I can do those three, then I'm I'm good. So yeah, I hear you there. Yeah, TLDR, right? Too long, didn't read. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's why uh, I like Mark's, Mark's blog now. posts. They're always really short. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I've been over the years. I need to. <laughs> um, yeah, that, that's actually deliberate. It's it's deliberate to keep them short. So the limit is the basic limit is five hundred words. So I, I I I hardly ever go over five hundred words, and the, I find that I find that process really the process of it is really interesting. So. There's uh, to keep most ideas. Actually, you can uh, and <laughs> self-help books. Are one of the, that's one of the problems. But most ideas you can actually distill pretty easily into whatever it is, two or three hundred words. And if you end up at six hundred, you probably you've probably got too many. And a lot of these kinds of those kinds of books, I find, are um, are really repetitive. So the the um, you know you, you get down to the nitty gritty in the first two chapters, and then it's just a repetition, and it's like, well, yeah, you know, yeah, it's uh, examples and stories, and yeah, yeah, and you you've done nothing to actually help your argument or help the point, or you know, I write very succinctly, but I don't always speak so succinctly. <laughs> Guilty is charged right here too. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, for my next selection, you could call this a cluster, but I'll, I'll focus on two particular ones. It's basically books by John Wooden, not about John Wooden, but books that Wooden has actually been involved in writing. Uh, the the very first one I read years ago, and I would probably still put among the top books for people to read, is they call me Coach. Because that's a very personal sort of autobiography, autobiography that wouldn't wrote. Um, this, I mean, I think I read that twenty some years ago. And to our, the earlier point I made about books that are that were influential, I read that early in my coaching career. So it was at a time where I was heavily influential. And to the point where I can I can go back and look at some of Wooden Sprint already. I don't know at this stage anymore. Um, the most recent book that of his that I read, which is uh, as the title would suggest, is very heavily business oriented, is Wooden on Leadership: How to Create a Winning Organization. Um, we got a good book. A lot of a lot of overlap. You know, you're always going to get his pyramid thrown in there somewhere. Uh, which is worth it, you know, for sure. Yeah, he does a good job explaining what that's all about. Um, but I, I think they call me coach was probably just a little bit more uh, personal, I guess, than than the newer one. I actually was, I had that on my uh, my first short list, and um, I actually have a companion book to the to they call me coach too because. It's another example for me, uh, and I read. I read. They call me coach. Might even have been one of the first coaching books that I ever read. Um, that uh, it's it's another one of those situations where his his practice, like how he actually worked, was not uh, always 
exactly as as his book and uh, his biography by Seth Davis, I think, um, is is really good about that. And without managing to or or he manages to also not um, downplay the success or denigrate his capabilities, but just um, you know making making it a bit more human, a bit more um, uh, as it was. And one other thing that that came up, <laughs> I actually heard this not long ago, so which is probably five years ago, but that um, uh, that wouldn't over the years. He did a really good job of um, um, expanding his own legacy. So with with some of the things that he did. So um, I, wooden is the wooden. They call me coach is a great book and one I would recommend reading the um, not the not the mirror. I call, I call them companion books. So the the second perspective. What was what was the author on the second one? I'm pretty because I like I said I, I actually looked at, at it and I think it's Seth Davis. I think it's just called Wooden. Okay. Um, yeah, Seth Davis. Yep. Wooden a Coach's Life by Seth Davis. Yeah, that that one's really good. And uh, yeah, he's the. Wooden, wooden stuff is really good. And one, uh, one interesting moment that I had, I was in the USA with an Italian coach, and um, we, I went to a bookshop and with him, and he didn't really speak very good English. But when we left, he had books to take with him. I was really surprised, and uh, well, not really surprised, a bit surprised, and uh, asked him what he got, and he opened the bag, and it was three John Wooden books. So. <laughs> It's a it's a coach that's that's had a really really massive influence. Apart from being definitively the best coach ever. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, that all everything I've read, both by I him, love John. It's true. And and about him, I think are very uh, very formative in helping me become a better coach, but also just very enjoyable as far as almost like from the entertainment side of it too. You know, yeah. John, that he was the reason, he was studied as the model coach. Yeah, I know. Well, I'm, I'm just curious what what the metrics are for making that determination. <laughs> um, there, are, it's a. I've written a couple of articles. There's a couple of articles on my blog about it, but, um, when they started to study coaching as a. I don't know as a as a skill, if you want of a better word, they. They, it was during his the last three or four years of his career, right? And yeah. they said this guy is objectively the best coach there is. So let's use that as a starting point for for studying coaching. And they went and watched him and and um, um, worked out the things that he did and wrote. Ended up writing two really really influential papers on it. That among other things, I yeah. studied at university. Hustles. Yep. There are a lot of hustles in his hustles. practice. <laughs> it was I was the, just going to say because because if somebody if if somebody were doing the counts today, you know they might argue that there's another UCLA coach who uh, his office I think was right next door or right down the hall. Scott Who? Yep. Yeah, was a, had a slightly more success in, in terms of titles, obviously. Uh, but in any case. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Mark, back to you. Um, so I, I thought Lauren might be going to um, don't going to step on this a little bit, but in the end he didn't. So um, I the um, the stuff about storytelling. So where that came up in the David Epstein section. So uh, stories are. Uh, the way that humans, uh, the humans, develop their societies, develop their cultures, and and pass on information from one generation to the next. And the one uh, really great author at doing that is uh, Michael Lewis came up, but uh, 
uh, is Ma- Malcolm Gladwell. Um, so he has that the ability to turn that information or some raw information using stories into ways that are are easily manageable. Um, he has had a negative effect on on uh, coaching and sport by the um, popularising and indeed naming the 10,000 hour rule. Um, but I don't think that we need to... I think that there are plenty of lessons in the 10,000 hour rule that are actually positive without, uh, in this case, killing the messenger. Are there messenger. any particular, particular books by Gladwell or just anything by Gladwell? Um, I Anything by Gladwell... Uh, and I was going to add uh, anything for economics in that section. And <laughs> um, economics was an awesome book. Yes, for economics, um, super for economics, and but all but all of them. So there are three for economics books and four, four or five Gladwell. But and you can read any of them. The, but the the overarching point for me is about um, understanding things in a different way and the the background idea being that the world might not work in the way that you think that it works um, and taking information uh, and looking at it in a in a different way or looking at a, in the case of freakonomics looking at a story and finding information to find out if it's actually true or not so um, as a as a group of books, as an idea, a literary literary idea, uh, that's been a really influential uh, area for me. Well, and the thing I would toss in there in terms of free economics, I mean, not only are they promoting the idea that you know you don't don't make assumptions, go out and test these things, but also the importance and you guys kind of I think touched on this in the interactions discussion, the importance of incentives. You know, because quite a bit of what they they find in their analysis is, yeah, incentives matter. Like the like this the uh, the sumo test. You know, there's an, there is an incentive to cheat, so people are cheating. Surprise. Yes. <laughs> people don't cheat for the money. By the way, people cheat because they cheat. Yep. That's why it's okay. the thing about the doping, uh, anti-doping, dose doping discussion that always annoys me. All right, Lauren. Anyway, you got one. For uh, us? Yeah, I just would comment on the Cloudwell books. I think, you know, like Tipping Point and Outliers were both fantastic books. Um, I do think when and I would hold this same with someone like David Epstein um, or any of the other um, any of the other uh, storytellers. Yeah, you know, journalists, investigative journalists or storytellers yeah. who are then taking these scientific concepts and then writing them in a way that the average reader can, well, I just screwed up, broke my own rule there. Um, well, you'll find out in a second, um, but the the you know the the more people can understand the information, um, mm-hmm. and but part of the problem there is sometimes in distilling that down, you actually break the facts, um, and we saw that with Gladwell on more than one occasion, I think, um, and so I think when you do pick up a book like that and you read it, you have to be willing to be critical of the information that's being relayed to you through story because we are going to be a little more likely to believe it because it's in the form of a story. And I think we have to be willing to be critical of, you know, is, is the 10,000 hour rule really a rule? (laughs) You know, people weren't critical of that. I mean, there was definitely a segment of society that was critical of it, but a small one and most people just bought into it and it became, you know, part of coaching culture to talk about the 10,000 hour rule. And, if anybody actually would have looked at the studies that were referenced, you would have found that, first off, the studies were on nothing to do with sports, and secondly, they were there was such a range of hours of before expertise 
And he just took the yeah. average of that range and said, let's, let's make it 10,000. And so yeah. I think there's, there's a massive problem when we have not, I mean, I, I love his writing, but I think we have a problem when he's, when they're taking these ideas and they're distilling them down or taking them out of context and then putting them forth through a story format that makes them seem more than they are. And, and, you know, I think that, you know, I Gladwell sense came out, obviously has come out and said, I was wrong. Um, but, you know, I think probably very, a lot less people have heard him say he was wrong than read that book. So, um, I, you know. I, I would like to, um, not that he needs it from me, but to defend, <laughs> to defend Gladwell a little bit in that I never read that book as this is, this is the way. So I read that book as this is that a lot of the people you think that you think pop out up out of nowhere did not in fact pop out of nowhere. They actually did a lot of work. And I read Anders Ericsson's um, paper as the importance is to practice is to practice effectively is to actually go out with a to practice deliberately. Right. There's no reason to not that you had to do all of these things. And I didn't read Gladwell in that way either. So when when people um, came up, you know, whatever it is, two years later, and and suddenly there's no such thing as talent, and it's only hard work. You know, that's I I. I actually don't think that's a reasonable reading of Gladwell's book. Now, maybe if I went back and read it again, I, uh, I, would, I would maybe think about it differently, but that's certainly nothing like what I took from the book. I yeah, the, and I think so. that's to your initial point. Well, maybe it was John's initial point was, you know, to some degree it's about who are you at the time of reading that book, you know, like... Absolutely. If I read that book when I was 22, I would have thought this was the gospel truth of coaching, and I need to make sure that I am following the Tiger Woods path for every volleyball player in my program. Um, but I read it later when I was a little bit better at critical thinking and mm -hmm. took kind of the same thing you did out of it. Okay, here's a book that's telling me what I already know, and that is that there's a lot of hard work that goes into being successful at anything. Yeah. Um, and, but again, I think yeah. through the use of powerful stories, which are the things that people pay attention to in a work like that, those stories yeah. then became interpreted as the truth. Um, and so I think there's a, there's a risk involved in that medium. Um, and, but, it's also any any time you have a book in your hands, the the meaning of the book is as much put forth by the person reading it as by the person who wrote it. So um, I think that that's also an important thing to remember when you're getting what you think is the truth from a book. It could be something as simple as confirmation bias or something like that. So I um, talked to me about that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> one of one of Mark's favorites. <laughs> uh, no, I don't want to. I don't want to talk about Kahneman. It's really okay. ruined my life. <laughs> <laughs> Mine too. I, I just got in a conversation about this the other day. Somebody was. I mentioned cognitive biases to somebody, and they're like, "I've never even looked into that. Can you give me some information on that?" And I was like, "I felt like I felt like." Uh, What's his name in the Matrix going, I it's have the red, red pill, pill, pill was just blue pill insane. right now. Like, this is your chance to choose the easy way and never look into this. Because if you start looking into this, you're going to look at life a whole different way. And it did for me, for sure. Well, uh, it, can, it can be a time saver, though, because especially confirmation bias. Yes. So if you understand that your first impression is the one that you're going to spend the rest of your life proving, then if you're a volleyball coach, watch 10 minutes of video, you already have your opinion, and then go on to the next thing. You don't have yeah. to spend the next uh, the next four hours confirming what you already think. 
Yeah, no, I, I agree. I think that's true with a lot of the different ones. It's been a time saver because it, I mean, like uh, survivorship bias is one for me that like understanding how that works is a time right. saver for me because instead of spending all this useless time on figuring out why this one person was successful, you skip over that <laughs> and you yeah. get to the, the nitty gritty. Yeah, like it's why an accident. Yeah, yeah, that person was. It's always an accident. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. I so I think it's I think it's uh, you're right. I had not thought of it that way. It definitely, but at the same time, you start to question just about everything. And that's and that kind of is rough. But I think that's good. <laughs> um, speaking of perceptions, I'm going to hit my last book. Uh, well, I, I mean my fourth. I do have a fifth, but um, it's not. I let, saved it to last just in case we didn't get to it. Um, but this one is probably my favorite on my list. This was the only book when we were talking about this idea. This was the first book that came to mind. And um, this was a huge a book that sh greatly shifted my perspective on coaching and on what we do in our gym. And the book is uh, The End of Average by Todd Rose. Um, and uh, basically, The End of Average explains the fundamental flaws with our culture of averages in which we design everything for the average person when that person doesn't exist and shows how we can embrace our individuality and use it to succeed in a world that wants everyone to be the same. He goes into a lot of history in this book, the history of our scholastic system, um, the history of our factory system, which are tied together. Um, it's a great historical um, reference to some of the things we are we see today and why, especially like the scholastic system um, and coaching, um, but just this concept of you know uh, you know there's no way to build something for the average human body because it doesn't exist. Um, he references the failed attempts by the U.S. Air Force to figure out why their fighter planes were losing dogfights during World War II, and I love that story that they, they had designed the cockpits to fit the average height of their – height. they used seven metrics of the human body, like height, arm length, leg length, foot size, waist size, and they averaged them all out, and they built a cockpit that fit the average, but in the long run it didn't fit any single person. So all these fighter pilots were actually struggling, <laughs> fighting with their plane more than they were fighting with this plane that was trying to shoot them down, and they were losing dogfights. And so they went to, I don't remember which company it was, but they went to a company and said, help us redesign our cockpits. And so this company actually designed all adjustable components. The seat, you know, the seat moved forward and backwards, the the I don't know what's on the fighter plane, but all the components that a person needed to reach and the way to reach them was all designed so that you could adjust it to match the individual who sat in that cockpit, which incidentally led to the same stuff showing up in cars. Um, and, and within like almost instantly, and that was the part that struck me, was almost instantly the fighter pilots for the United States started winning the dogfights, and some people actually attribute it to a change in the war, at least the Asian front of the war, um, because of the success that the fighter pilots were now having, now that they could actually use the plane the way that they were intended to, instead of trying to figure out how to force the plane, force the person to meet the plane instead of adjust the plane to match the person. Um, he also you goes sure, into the. You no, sure, it wasn't just the. You sure, it wasn't just the pilots who got up there ten thousand hours and they were good at fighting. <laughs> there dog fights. That. Maybe the ones that were losing their dog fights were the bad ones, and the only ones left were the good ones. <laughs> right. Survival for last. That's where I was going to go with that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's all kinds of ways to to take it. I suppose. Um, it, one of his other points in it is that. Your, your character traits are unrelated to how you learn, um, which means there aren't any average career paths. 
you know, you, you get all these different Myers-Briggs and all these different things that try to take the idea of averages and point you in the direction that you're supposed to go. And he's basically saying, all oh, that's junk. Like, you don't, your, your character traits and all those things have nothing to do with what you're going to be good at in life. You as an individual are the person that determines that. And so you need to find what's right for you, not base it off some tests that thousands of people take and put their trust in and end up unhappy in their careers. Um, and then uh, the last point or another big one is human behavior is fluid and not fixed, which means we must accommodate individuality. You know, referencing this fact that we have a tendency that once someone's doing something or once someone acts a certain way or whatever, the, that's the way they are. And the reality is we change. Um, we change throughout the course of our lives and there's, you know, we need to be, we need to accommodate that. Like if somebody starts a job and because their personality at that time matches the job, but then they start you know, changing the way they think about the world, maybe they're going to try a different job and leave this very successful thing to go do something else. And we need to be acceptable of that. Um, so anyway, it's a really great book about the, pow the, the problems with using averages to basically run our world and our culture. And I took it very much as a coach, like looking at the fact that everybody on my team was doing the exact same warm-up. Well, that's dumb. You know, who was this warm-up designed for? The average kid. Okay, so let's get a specific warm-up for each individual kid. Um, we were, you know, we look at this concept of perfect technique in our sport, and I think that's a result of... I don't... I know you don't, and <laughs> um, but a lot of people do, and I think that's a result of kind of an average, kind of an, this same idea of averages. What would work for the average volleyball player? Well, there is no average volleyball player. There's yeah. a whole bunch of unique people who need to find their own solution. So when you force them, when you force a player to do something a way that you believe will work, it's like forcing a pilot to step into a fighter plane that was built for somebody six inches shorter and 20 pounds heavier. Um, so I think that the, the, it really affected me, um, this book. We, I, I read it over a weekend. I stepped into my gym. I don't, we don't do a lot of things like in mid-season where I'm just going to come in and be like, we're changing everything. But we did, uh, after I read this, I was like, we're changing stuff. And it wasn't everything, but it was some things, you know, that I thought were we needed to change to be more focused on the individual because we've always talked about we're we're an individually focused gym we're about that player in front we're that we're athlete centered we use that terminology and then I was like after reading this I was like no we're not <laughs> we're we're centered around some mythical athlete who doesn't exist we need to get centered around that athlete who's standing in front of me and so we stepped we started changing things quite a bit after I read this book it had a massive impact on me the way I view the world too. I mean, I, like you heard me earlier, I've been really trying hard not to use the word average ever again when re referring to an individual person. Sure, if I'm looking at a group of data and I want to know what the average is, I think that's still valid. But I think when you're looking at an individual, don't, don't interact with them based on an average of some group of data, interact with them based on, and that comes back to your first book, John, which was the, you know, the guys battle to bond and girls bond to battle. Those are based on averages. And to me, get rid of those average looks at people, the average response, and let's get to the individual. How do I motivate you? Um, how do I help you get better? And it might be very different than the kid next to you. So. So that was a big, that was a really important book for me, and I highly recommend it. The whole book was great. He did a lot of storytelling in it, um, but I thought that all the stories really helped you accept, not accept, helped you dive deeper into the ideas in it. So, okay. there's Mark. He's pointing off into nowhere. Yeah. Um, with this. Yeah, because I'm on my phone. 
and I needed to change something and then there you go. Okay. Oh, now you're back. All right. Uh, okay. Uh, unless you have anything to add, Mark, I'll do mine. Uh, I like Next it. One. All right. I haven't read it. I like it. Excellent. It's a good one. Um, my fourth contribution is the only volleyball one that I'll toss in, specifically volleyball, and it's Mike Hebert's final book, uh, which is Thinking Volleyball. Yep. And I've, I've read all those other ones. The first two, some people probably even don't even know, exist. Uh, his, his original book was The Fire Still Burns that he, I uh, don't even remember when he wrote it, maybe early 90s, something around there. And it was very biographical, autobiographical, about his experience, uh, especially coaching at Pittsburgh, uh, but also uh, I think he was at New Mexico. His, uh, his second book was Strategies for Winning Volleyball, that's when he had moved on to Illinois. That one gets a little bit more kind of into strategy. Obviously, as the title suggests, he talks about the audible offense or the kind of, I think he described it as the primary hitter offense. Um, this last book, I think those two are out of print, so you'd have to find a copy of it somewhere, you know, uh, get it through a dealer or something. Uh, Thinking volleyball, though, he, he takes he goes kind of along the lines of, of some stuff we talked about in terms of encouraging critical thinking in a lot of different aspects of coaching. And one of the ones that, that always sticks with me is Tim talking about the use of the competitive cauldron. And he, he doesn't disagree with the idea that the cauldron has value. And if you, know, if you don't know what the cauldron is, uh, you know, look it up because I don't want to get into a huge conversation about it here. But let's just say statistics, because it's, it's kind of broadly about statistics. In practice. And his, yeah, the cauldron in practice. But he even match statistics, he, he kind of lumps in the air a little bit as well. Uh, his point is there, you reach a certain level where it's a kind of a law of diminishing returns, where you're, you're spending more, more time collecting and analyzing the data than you're actually deriving value from it. So he doesn't say it's not valuable, it's not useful. He just says that there reach the points of limitations. Um, so there's, there's a lot of that sort of encouragement in different areas. He talks about offensive defense. He, he talks about different aspects of, of coaching with careers. And it covers you know, a, pretty much the full gamut of coaching. And it basically challenges you to constantly be thinking about the things that you're taking in and the, the, the thoughts that you already have established about whatever it is you're doing, um, which I think is something, as we've kind of alluded to, as uh, every coach needs to, to have in mind. Yeah, I thought it was a great book. Um, I didn't take away from it as much as I had hoped when I got it, um, but I certainly challenged me in a lot of my thinking about coaching, and I enjoyed learning about things dealing with coaching that I don't have any experience in, you know, like his referencing to some of the collegiate stuff that I've never experienced and nor will I ever. Um, and that's always fun to read that side of things. That's a side of coaching our sport that I have zero experience with. So. Uh, I have it and I've read, I've read bits of it. Um, I've met Mike a couple of times. Um, I don't have many, much else to say about him. He's a really nice guy. <laughs> Unfortunately, no longer with us. Yes. Uh, and I will finish that book at some point. Okay. Good to know. Um, Lauren, it sounded like you were more or less done. Uh, Mark, do you have anything else you want to add? Because I can... We can do some quick hits. I've got, uh, well, I've got one more book I'd love to talk about. We're okay. super brief. And then I have <laughs> too long of a list that I was just going to be like, boom, 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 boom. Here's a bunch of books <laughs> um, if you want that. But the one book, I have one more book that I'd love to let it, you guys and anybody else listening or who listens to this in the future know about because I think it's a super important one. And it is a coaching book. Okay. 
Or about you, Mark? What are you, what are you uh, I can I can do one. I can do one fastish. All right. So, so go for it. Uh, I didn't actually think of this until uh, till the start. I had a different one in this spot, but uh, when Lauren was talking about things that influenced him, um, this book is probably the book that influenced the way that I think about things more than any other book, uh, other than being a natural contrarian, uh, and that's uh, Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. Um, and that was, uh, I think there's no other way to describe it than it's, <laughs> it's, the, it's the blue pill or the red pill, I don't remember which one. The one that puts yeah. you in the matrix. The one that takes Absolutely. you out of the matrix, rather. Yeah. And, uh, and I've even read the, the second, the, his, his follow-up to that. So um, it's just it's about how about looking at things and looking at things in a different way and a different perspective. Hey, 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 Mark, Mark, do me a favor. Pull your, pull your, I think your mic is scraping up against your, your T-shirt. Uh, no, the mic Can is you... in the computer. Sorry, sure? is that better? Sure it's... Yeah, yeah, I'm not hearing it right okay. now. All right. Okay. Um, so, yeah, yeah the, no, the, art of, no, the Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance is, sorry? As soon as you started talking, it came back. But yeah, God, it's just the mic. It's not that bad. As long as you don't move around too much, everything's good. I think. Uh, yeah. The mic is actually static, so nothing's touching it. Um, no, I think so, the yeah. mic is actually in your headset. It's actually in no, your headset, but no, it's ahead. not. The, the mic is in the is in the phone. Oh, it's in the okay. Um, yeah, Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. How you look at everything, and that there's a different way to look at everything. Yeah. And there is. Yeah, I, that was a, that's a fantastic book. Um, super influential on me. Um, as a side to that, I came across, I'd have to look for it. I've got it on my computer somewhere. A uh, well-known um, soccer, football coach um, who used the ideas of that book to analyze youth soccer in the United States. And he wrote, he wrote, I think he wrote, he wrote it on uh, LinkedIn and it was an art. He would write an article, a, a chapter basically. I think he got up to 45 chapters on LinkedIn and I copied all of them, created a PDF out of it, emailed him and asked if it was okay if I had done that. Um, to share with people because I thought it was just different thinking. And he said, absolutely. I put it on LinkedIn because I wanted people to read it. I don't care how it's shared. Um, so I'll find it. I'll send it off to you guys. Uh, it, it is a, it was, soccer's not a sport that I'm super familiar with, but youth coaching is something that I do for a living. And so it, really had a lot of it. it was just like that book it was it made you look at things from a completely different angle you know i mean i heard someone the other day say that when they tried to uh when they tried to talk to someone about their coaching philosophy a lot of times people will say well we're just on a different page like you know we're not on the same page and she had said this is different than being on the same page. We're actually just not in the same library. <laughs> and I find that that's very true of the art of, uh, you know, of, of Duhigg's book. And then the, this piece written based on that, it's just a completely different look at things that if you spend enough time with it, it does shape your perceptions a little bit differently too, which is good. Um, can I hit my, speaking of that whole idea, actually, okay. it's a good segue, I guess. What did you have one? on? Yep. The, yeah, this one I wanted to talk about is um, brand new, like two days ago, brand new. Uh, it's called The Language of Coaching by Nick Winkleman, um, who is uh, currently working as the sports, head of sports performance for Irish rugby, um, but has worked in the United States um, 
And his, the book is very heavily based on the research of Gabrielle Wolf and her optimal theory of motor learning, which is pretty much the most modern motor learning um, concepts that have been proposed. Um, and the center of her, this optimal theory is three things um, that need to be present to optimize motor learning. Um, autonomy, external focus, and increased expectancy. And if you can have those three things present, it massively increases the rate at which anyone doing any motor activity will learn that activity. Um, and so Nick has been using these ideas. He used these ideas when he was a combine coach for the NFL. He worked for uh, Exos and would work in the combines to help the NFL players do better in the combine. And he started using these ideas then. He then moved into uh, Irish rugby and has been using these ideas working with the athletes there. Um, he's awesome. His ideas, he presents it in such a such an easy way to understand. And he's really good at storytelling. And um, But anyway, just the, the, the basic synopsis of this book is that it, it focuses on the impact that communication has on an individual's ability to learn and perform movement. Um, the book examines how instruction, feedback, and cueing can significantly affect training outcomes. It's grounded in motor learning and the science of attentional focus. And it takes you on a journey guiding you through practical coaching frameworks that will help you adapt your language to the learning needs of the person in front of you. Um, packed with stunning visuals, the book provides over 25 movement sequences that outline different types of coaching cues, including a visual depiction of unique analogies such as a sprinter taking off like a jet or an athlete loading into a jump like a spring. Um, it's filled with a comprehensive collection of cueing frameworks, um, blah, blah, blah. Uh, the biggest thing is his whole take on this is that the language you use, meaning the word, the meaning of the words that we use with our athletes has a profound effect on how well they learn. And so, and the big one is that external focus. Instead of asking an athlete to focus on body parts and what their body is doing, get them to focus on externally, on the effect of their actions or using analogy to create an image in their brain of what their body is going to do that has nothing to do with their body. And so you, you speed up the connection between the brain and the body when you are removing the internal focus um, is one of the main points. And he goes into a lot of the science behind that that Gabrielle Wolf and others have done. I mean, you had Harjeev on, didn't you? John, did you have Harjeev Singh on? Your yeah, thing? yeah. Couple, so yeah, he's like a, a week, like a week and a half ago. Yeah. Yeah. So he's a student of Gabriel Wolf's, and he's also very well versed in all of this. Mm -hmm. And uh, so his, you know, we've we've had some conversations about it, and this is it's awesome. Like we we adopted these ideas of Gabriel Wolf's um, optimal theory two years ago into our gym, and we've seen a massive shift because of that. Um, you know, the autonomy part. I, if you don't have autonomy, you're not going to get learners, great learners. Uh, if you, uh, the external focus, I think is, it's a hard change as a coach when you come from a background like I did that was very technically oriented and always talking about, well, here's where your right toe, big toe should be pointed while you pass a volleyball and here's where your elbow should be. And then in releasing that idea and getting more, getting athletes to focus outside of themselves on the effect on the ball or what they're doing to the ball or where they want the ball to go or what they're saying or looking at with your teammates or doing things in relationship to the net and always talking about the things that are outside their body instead of inside their body. Um, and then the, ex it, it, the increased expectancies is the basically just that idea that the athlete has a high level of belief in their ability to perform the action that's being asked of them.
Um, not 100% certainty because then there's no learning going on, but that there is a degree of belief in their ability. And they've shown some pretty cool studies. And Gabrielle Wolf's actually worked with a lot of volleyball um, during her studies. Um, a surprisingly large number of her experiments or tests or whatever you want to call them have involved volleyball players, uh, both beginners of, of all levels, beginners, intermediate, and experts. Um, and just some of the things she's come up with from her work that Nick references in his book are pretty pretty cool little tweaks that you can do in your gym to increase the learning. Um, giving athletes a choice gives them that autonomy and then all of a sudden they learn faster. But the choice you give them doesn't have to have anything to do with the skill they're trying to learn. You know, they right. did, they've shown these tests or these research where simply giving an athlete the choice of what music they would listen to before a test helped them perform better on the test. Even though the, the, the motor learning test had nothing to do with music. Um, and so it, it's, it's a pretty cool, it, but this book, I think any, I would go so far as to say any coach should read this book. Um, I think it will, if enough coaches read it, it could revolutionize how we coach in a very good way. So it's, it's interesting you bring that word up because I actually had somebody with a question just about external cues and they were like external cues, which obviously this isn't going to be one, but it might give them a thought about how those cues could be constructed. Yeah, and he gives a lot of examples about how to actually take our, um, you know, a more traditional internal focus and internal cue and how to turn that into a more optimal external focus and external cue. Um, and that's the best part about it. It's not just the theory. It's actually coming from a guy who applies this theory every day of his life working with athletes and how he wants that, you know. You can also, he's got a pretty awesome Instagram page or an Instagram account right now that's sharing a ton of the information from the book um, on his Instagram. And it's just, he's awesome. I'm, I've been following Nick um, for probably 15 years, the stuff that he does, and it's just getting better and better and better and better. And uh, yeah, I, I can't recommend this book enough. I've only read maybe a third of it, and I, it's, it's awesome. So sure. anyway, wanted to make sure I threw that one in there, even though I haven't read sure. it all the way through yet. I think it's, it's an important enough and good enough book to recommend without. Now, if the, sec, if the last two thirds are terrible, I'll make sure I let you know. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. There you go. Now, I was just going to say, uh, there's some titles I can throw out there, of books that have been recommended. I'm looking, Mark, for your reference, I'm actually looking at the Wizards recommendations. Um, we've got nobody categorized. Mentioned, nobody mentioned that book. That was kind of lame. Yeah, I was, <laughs> I was 104% certain that John would have it in his thought. <laughs> I, well, I'm not that self-serving, generally speaking. And you did promote your own book, more yeah, or less. That's true, no, yeah. Not exactly your book, but the book that you got published. So I didn't want to double dip, so to speak. <laughs> I also have a list of games of, I don't know, too um, many, but too many. It's already been yeah. out there. Volleyball coaching wizards and volleyball coaching wizards, wizard wisdom. There you go. All right. So, all right, let me toss out some, uh, some ones that are on this list. Uh, Terry Pettit's got some interesting stuff. It's, I wouldn't put him at the level of the stuff that we've talked about already, the books that we've talked about already, but he's got an interesting perspective and his writing style is kind of unique. So for a, a, a change of pace read, and he's got some good stories. So when he's a he's a writer, like he's an actual yeah. like English and, and a major poet. and a poet. Yep. So like yeah, taught it taught it yeah. before he went full time coaching. Um, let's see, we brought up Moneyball. Uh, we brought up Walls. Um, a coach's life. My forty years in college basketball. Dean Smith. The winner within. Pat Riley. 
That was definitely one that came up in, in the Wizards conversations. Uh, Champions Mind, uh, Jim F. 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 Mo. Uh, Leading with the Heart, Mike Krzyzewski. Ace the Roof, Pat, was Pat Summit. Uh, see, Inner Game of Tennis, that one yep. could very easily be on this list that we didn't actually touch on. Yeah. You know, he's one of the first people to put publicly out these ideas that now, like Gabrielle Wolf has mm -hmm. shown through research, are actually, has scientifically validated those ideas now. Right. Yep. So. Um, Coach just right the game. Exactly. Yeah. Well, they're the ones experimenting. Practitioners usually are. Uh, um, let's see. We got Gladwell. Uh, uh, Drive by Daniel Pink. Cool. Mindset, of course, by Dweck. Seven Habits, Mark mentioned. The One Thing, <laughs> didn't, Keller. Um, didn't mention it like, like, like favorably. <laughs> I could never bring myself, <laughs> after that, I could never read, bring myself to read that book. I have to say about Mindset, well, mindset? I, I read, well, no, no, oh, Seven no. Habits. Seven Habits. Okay. But I could never, I started reading the first page of Mindset and I said, well, duh, to <laughs> And then I, I just said, okay, if, if I know stuff, I don't need to read a book about it. Well, that's exactly what you talked about before, about once you, you know, once things are confirmed, you don't need to carry on. Yeah, yeah. You, wait, you, you save yeah, yourself a bunch of time. The, the, idea that, the idea that to get better at something, you have to try to get better at it, I, I don't think is worth a whole book. Yeah. Yeah, there's definitely a lot of, all right, we've outlined the principle in the first chapter or two, and then everything else is examples from there yeah. on. Well, one of the things that I could have brought up, talked about in my intro was um, to be aware of books that are selling a product at the end of it. Yeah. Mm. So, um, Pete Carroll's book, for example. <laughs> yep. Uh, we've got Good to Great by Jim Collins. Um, Tim Grover, yeah. Uh, Who Moved My Cheese, Spencer Johnson. The Little Book of Talent, which of course is a follow up to the Talent Code by Coyle. If you're going to read e either of those, code, the Little Book right. is pro it's, it's probably uh, the Little Book is probably more concise than Talent Code. Uh, kind of gets right into things a little bit quicker. Uh, obviously, that one kind of has a lot to do with the, the 10,000 hours and stuff, but uh, you know, and as I'm reading it, I'm going, there's a lot of stuff in here that could easily be interpreted as you need to block train everything. Yeah. Because the focus is on like violin. Yeah. We're stuff where it's very precise. You, you have to do the same, you have to do one thing the same way over and over again. Uh, but the whole idea of myelin production and all that is, is certainly worthwhile. To, to conceptually understand. Um, anything else you guys want to toss out there? Uh, Mark, do you got any others you want to throw out? Uh, the, the one that I was going to mention as fifth before I thought of Zen was uh, IX, IX Barcelona Cruyff, or Cruyff IX Barcelona, uh, which is a, another Johan Cruyff, the football player and coach, and... Uh, his different perspective on things. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, uh, there's a whole bunch of other bits and pieces that are the, the themes. The themes that always come out for me are um, thinking differently, approaching a problem from a different perspective, and the real life versus um, real life versus how you yeah. imagine you'd like yeah. to be. Yeah. And everything I can come up with up yep. is under the same themes. So, gotcha. Yeah, I've had some really good conversations with um, okay. Corey's son-in-law, Todd Bean, um, who is oh yeah, basically took over his coaching program in Spain, <laughs> and uh, is following the same philosophies that Corey had, and it's 
very similar. I mean, when we talk, the few conversations we've had, we're sharing the exact same ideas just in two different sports. And so it's, it was kind of cool to be able to connect with somebody like that and share our similarities as well as a few unique ideas between us. Mm -hmm. um, a few other books I would add to the group. Um, big one that had a big effect on me was Inside Out Coaching by Joe Ehrman. Um, because I think, again, we're only as effective a coach as we are comfortable in our own skin. And so I think that uh, his concept of work on the inside, work on who you are as a human being before you're fully invested in influencing other human beings is an important thing. I think you can do it concurrently, but I think there has to be a focus. And I thought his book was really good about that. Um, I also had Thinking Fast and Slow on here because I that book blew my mind. Um, Switch by Chip and Dan Heath um, was a book that came at a really great time for me and helped me really understand how to, the, the science behind behavioral change, and it helps both me and what we do in our gym. Um, anything by Brene Brown. Darren Greatly is my favorite. Um, Rising Strong, uh, any of them are great. I also had Drive by Daniel Pink. We use his three-letter uh, autonomy, mastery, and purpose, the points that come from uh, self, uh, whatever it's called, um, the theory that he based that whole book on. Um, and we use that in our gym. We call it our motivational map. Mastery, Autonomy, and Purpose. Um, the Richie McGaw's autobiography. I thought it was fabulous. Um, one of my favorite athletes in the world, and I learned a lot from that book as far as to apply to coaching. Um, Jim Lohr, uh, psychologist, sports performance specialist, um, or mental performance specialist. He has a book called The Only Way to Win, um, which is about putting character above <laughs> other things. And I thought that was really good. Uh, Fergus Connolly has a book out called Game Changer, which literally can be a game changer for a lot of people. It's big and weighty and a lot of information, but if you can make it through, I think it's worth it. The Performance Cortex by Zach Schoenbrunn is another book focusing on the science of the brain and how it relates to sports specifically. They did a lot of research in baseball to show that a lot of things we believe are incorrect now that science can actually track what's going on in our brains during action. Um, Nonlinear, what's that? Blue pill. Yeah, exactly. The world doesn't work like you think it works. Yeah, exactly. Yep. Um, Nonlinear pedagogy and skill acquisition by Chow, Davids, Button, and Renshaw is a crazy science filled book with a lot of science and no stories. Um, that I remember at least. Um, it's hard. To, it was hard for me to get through not being like a science. I like science, but I have no science background. So it's really hard. It was hard for me to get through, but I certainly took a lot out of it and really enjoyed the concepts behind, which I strongly believe in that learning is a nonlinear process. And if we can embrace that and work with it, we're going to do our athletes better. I also had inner game of tennis on here. Um, a book, I really enjoyed is a book called Biased by Jennifer Eberhardt, which basically talks about all the different cognitive biases that we're subject to every day and will make you look at your life very differently, much like thinking fast and slow. Um, a conglomeration of writings called Mindfulness and Acceptance in Sport, which was edited by Henriksen, Hansen, and Larson, um, who I believe work for the Norwegian Olympic program. I could be wrong on that, but uh, mindfulness and acceptance in sport is basically using mindfulness and acceptance theory, which is a therapeutic psychological tool for people who are usually like addictive or like addicts and things like that, but using that instead as a way to motivate um, athletes, and I thought it was fantastic. And then a brand new one by one of the Heath brothers that wrote switch um, by Dan Heath that's brand new called Upstream 
which is basically using systems thinking and applying it to life. And as you both have heard me say many times, I find that if we can figure out how to apply systems thinking to sports, uh, we're going to end up being better coaches. And he talks a lot about that in this book upstream about how the application of, you know, there's a story that he tells, which I'm sure you've heard before about, you know, imagine you're at a river with a friend and a baby floats by in the river and you both run out and grab the baby and save its life. And just as you're getting out of the water, another baby starts floating by and you go in and you grab the other baby and you pull it out and you save its life. Just as another baby starts to float by and you go in after it and your friend starts walking up the river and you're like, where are you going? And your friend says, I'm going up the river to punch in the face whoever's throwing all these babies in the water. Um, and that's the whole purpose behind this, the name of the book upstream is that if we're always dealing with the problems that are in front of us, all of those problems usually have a, an earlier conceptual phase, something that started that problem. And if we can go upstream and address the problem, we're going to have a wider and deeper effect than we would if we're just addressing the problem in front of us. And I find that has an incredibly massive applicability to coaching because a lot of times we're just reacting to the thing that happened in front of us and not realizing that that thing is a manifestation of a whole lot of stuff that happened before. And if we can go upstream a little ways and work on some other stuff, we're, we don't have to worry about these reactionary coaching style, you know, attempts. So um, anyway, that's my, Oh, I have one more, and that's um, Finite and Infinite Games by... Yep. Uh, that's a good one. I read that um, a long time ago. Yeah, um, that is a book just on a personal level for me, like not coaching-wise, but just by James Kars. Um, similar to what you said about the Zen book, um, it just changed the way I looked at the world right. and my place in it and what I wanted to do with my time on earth. And, um, but it's also about games. So I, it's really applicable to coaching. And um, I thought it was, you know, a really cool, one of my favorite quotes from it is the fact that you can't, you can't force anyone to play a game. Um, if someone's playing a game, if someone's playing while being forced, they're not playing a game. They're not playing, they're working. And so I really took that to heart in coaching that we can't force any of those kids to be there playing a game. We have to figure out a way to design the environment, design the game and design the task that is fun enough and motivating enough that they want to do it out of their own accord instead of being forced into it by an adult. So, but there's a lot of other stuff out of that book that I got just for me personally, um, a way for me to look at life a little bit better. Um, similar to this stuff by Alan Watts, who's my favorite philosopher. And I could go do an entire talk on just Alan Watts, but I'll you could go that. days on YouTube watching Alan Watts videos. Oh yeah. Uh, I have everything he's ever done. It's a, <laughs> I think it's a 27 gigabyte folder on my computer that has every video and every book he's ever written. And I'm in it at least once a day. Um, Cause it, yeah. If, you know, when people say, who's the one guy you would want to have lunch with, living or dead? It's him, 100%. Some choice. Well, uh, the, one, the one I'll throw one in. One person there, outside my family, I guess. So. Okay. We mm -hmm. mentioned Erickson and, and all the talent code and all that. Uh, Erickson did a book called Peak Science, uh, The Secrets from the Science of Expertise. It's primarily about deliberate practice, but the thing that I found interesting personally was the discussion of mental representations and how the process toward mastery basically involves creating more and more effective and efficient mental rep representations. And if we understand that as coaches, then that can influence how we're trying to teach players skills and how we get them to try to think toward, toward the intention that you guys talked about and, and what they're trying to achieve. Unless you... Um unless you like to hold to some of the concepts of ecological psychology and ecological dynamics, and they refute the idea of mental models and mental representation. Um, and I am uh, um, probably more on that side of the fence than I am on the other. So 
still a great book, but. Mark, anything, any final stuff from you? Um, Alan Watt, the English, the English philosopher, or yes. Alan Watt, yes. the Canadian Watts. author? Uh, Watts, Watts. E English philosopher who brought, basically credited for bringing most of Zen Buddhist ideas to the Western world. I don't have anything to add. No, not least because I have 1% battery left on my phone. Uh-huh. That'll do it. <laughs> Perfect timing then. Those are Excellent. good. Excellent. Worked out really well. All right. Well, we had a big crowd on Facebook from the looks of it. So cool. this, was a, this was a nice experiment. Nice. Um, thank you both.